Welcome to chapter 3, session 3b of Old Testament history, the inception of a nation. Fasten your seatbelts, because I'm going to get even with the adversary for making me sick. Here comes the counterpunch. When God first called Moses, he informed him how high the stakes would be in Exodus 4.21. And the Lord said to Moses, When you go to return into Egypt, see that you do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in your hand, but I will cause his heart to be hardened, that he shall not let the people go. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn, and I say unto thee, Let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. Ooh. A lot had transpired between when Moses told Pharaoh that and the night of the Passover. Nine out of the ten plagues had occurred and had brought Egypt to its knees. God had all but come out in the open to deliver his people from the abusive Egyptians. His judgments had shaken earth and sky. His superiority over the gods of Egypt had been unmistakably demonstrated and now it was coming down to the last straw. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. It would take a mighty hand to pry Israel out of the clutches of the adversary and his blind surrogate, Pharaoh. But that great hand would do two things. It both delivered them and it marked them. No other nation would be so favored. No other nation would be so rescued. No other nation would be so designated as God's people. They had better walk accurately after that. They had better stay within God's protective law after that. For after that, the adversary vehemently and cruelly would target them and if they strayed very far out from under God's wings, it wouldn't last very long. Israel was God's firstborn. That figurative designation carries with it all the prestige and power and entitlement that goes with that label. They were the race through whom the Messiah would come. They were assigned to march into the future under that banner and fight for that cause that one day the Messiah would come and strike the blow that would inexorably and ultimately lead to the extermination of the adversary and all evil. Knowing this full well, Satan furiously focused all his wiles on them. Some might complain that wasn't fair. Some might say the severity of the punishment for their infractions didn't fit the degree of their crimes. But the truth is, they had been thrust into a battle between titans, and it was their choice if they would become God's crack troops or cannon fodder. All of this hinged upon one night, one event, one covenant, the Passover. On that night, just like on another night, in 1775, when Paul Revere's midnight ride occurred, similarly, nations were born. He wrote to warn Samuel Adams and John Hancock and others, my ancestor, Robert Morris, was their peer, who also signed the Declaration of Independence. Consequently, our infant nation rode along on Revere's horse. Both those nights, everything changed. Families had to pick sides. 
let these parallel events now unfold. Look at Exodus 12, 1. Exodus 12, 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months, and it shall be the first month of the year to you. And we're going to see that it was the beginning in other ways as well. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And of the household be ye too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Now we know what that means. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it unto the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. The entrance of the home was marked with blood. And there was no going back after that. Either the next morning all Egypt would be in mourning, thrusting them out as promised, or all Israel would be in mourning because of Egypt's sure retaliation. Now we know who all of you are. All of you who are following that renegade traitor Moses. He told them the death angel was on its way, and they had to mark their houses. They had to choose sides. Would it work? Would they be spared? Or was it an empty threat? Just like in the Ukraine recently, when the enemy soldiers came in and hunted down the Ukrainian patriot families, but saved the collaborators, the Egyptians would have done the same. But they wouldn't have to consult the collaborators, like the British, who asked the Tories who the renegade patriots were, it was painted on their front door. My progenitor, Kunrat Nesslerot, came over a couple of decades earlier from the Netherlands for religious freedom. He and my family had to take a stand for independence. Two of my ancestors, with their last name changed to Nessel, fought with George Washington. But what? if the Passover prophecy did not come to pass. Do you see the daring stand that they took against the Egyptians? Wow, but there's even more here. As I mentioned in the last session, Diane Martinez taught us about something we had not known before, which was the Threshold Covenant. It was a variation on the theme of the Blood Covenant and it was a prominent part of everyday culture in ancient times. When people were invited into one's house, they entered through the door, and the protection of the house was upon them then, as was seen with Lot and the angels that visited him in Sodom. That was something taken very seriously. It was part of the customs of hospitality demonstrated by Abraham and the three angels that visited him. But it goes deeper, because the patriarch of each house also was the domestic priest. They determined which god was worshipped in that house and how. We see that still being observed in the book of Acts, when the leader of the house converted to Christianity, his entire house went with him. That it was why Jesus told the Samaritan woman at the well to go get her husband. So, to the ancient mind, the Passover absolutely would evoke allusions to the Threshold Covenant. H. Clay Trumbull, in his book, The Threshold Covenant, says, If you entered by the door, he said, quote, Crossing the threshold or entering the door of a house is in itself an implied covenant with those who are within. He goes on to point out, 
in his book, quote, It would seem to have been in accordance with this primitive law of the East that Jesus said, He that entereth not by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and go out, and shall find pasture. The thief comes not, but for that, that he may steal and kill and destroy. I am come that they may have life, and may have it abundantly. Unquote. Who knew the relevance of that door in that scripture? Now we do. Jesus is our golden door to a new birth of freedom. So there is further implication involved. This house with its domestic priest, the leader of the family, stands with God. Crossing over our doorstep is a sacred thing because this is a house of God. This is where the true God is worshiped. We live by the creed of the true God, not Egypt's gods who were all shamed and defeated. Exodus chapter 12, verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Well, you know what? The firstborn would be the next in line to be the domestic priest after the patriarch died. That's interesting, isn't it? Verse 13, And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses wherein you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass. That's the Hebrew word, pasa, Strong's number 6452. I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Jezenius, in his Hebrew Chaldee lexicon, page 683, mentions the word pass, Strong's number 6452, pasa, and it was used to cross over the Euphrates River, hence Passover. Then, the metaphorical meaning, to pass over as in to spare. Trumbull elaborates more about this on page 210. This Pesach, translated Passover, is a peculiar one. Its etymology and root meaning have been much in discussion. It's derived from the root Pesach, to cross over, a meaning which is still preserved in the Hebrew word Tipsach, the name of a city on the banks of the Euphrates, the Hebrew equivalent of the classical Thepascus. Tifsach means crossing, apparently so-called from the ford of the Euphrates at that place, unquote. This is the Passover. Interestingly, both of the meanings of the word are involved. It's like an ontonoclasis in the scripture there, although not contained within the same sentence. Here in verse 13, the meaning of spare is used for Passover. But a few verses later, the other meaning is used to cross over. There's also a covenant language word here in the word token. The word token is oth, O-T-H, Strong's number 226, which means pledge, assurance, a sign indicating a covenant. In other words, it's a covenant indicator, oth. It's a pledge sign, a token. An example is in Genesis 9:12, And God said this, the rainbow, is the token, oth the pledge sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud and it shall be for a token, oth, 
a pledge sign of a covenant between me and the earth. Verse 17, And God said unto Noah, This is the token, Oth, the pledge sign of the covenant, which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. Another instance is in Genesis 17, 11. And you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token, Oth, a pledge sign of the covenant between me and you. Here's some more language referring to the threshold covenant in Exodus 12, 21. Exodus 12, 21. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, Draw out, take you a lamb according to your families, and kill the Passover. Verse 22. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin. That's the word saph, S-A-P-H, Strong's number 5592, and it means threshold. They had the basin, a carved out depression, in the threshold of the doorway. That's the basin. So they were doing the threshold covenant with the blood of the lamb. And then strike the lintel and the two side posts. So, so the lintel is the part of the doorway over the top and the two side posts, the right vertical and the left vertical with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. Now, Diane taught us the word basin is saf, Strong's 5592. It means basin, sill, or threshold. And the reason that these words are associated there is that the doorstep, the threshold, had a basin, a depression carved out in it to hold blood for the purpose of the threshold covenant when guests entered into the house. So when you stepped through the doorway, you didn't step in the basin. You stepped across it. To step on it would be a disgrace. See, the book of Judges has a clear reference of this. Look at Judges 19.27. Judges 19.27. And her Lord rose up in the morning and opened the doors of the house and went out to go his way, and behold, the woman, his concubine, was fallen down at the door of the house, and her hands were upon the saf, the threshold. Unfortunately, this woman had been gang-raped and survived long enough to struggle home, and then she died with her hands at the doorstep. So, at her last she was appealing to the protection of the house. Exodus 12:23. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood upon the lintel and upon the two side posts, the Lord will pass over, pasa, cross over the door. He will enter into the house, in other words and will not allow the destroyer to come into your house to smite you. See, this advertisement that this was God's house was overt. It was brash. It was obvious. It was unmistakable. It was brave. For the blood was not only in the basin, but the ritual was exaggerated to paint blood all around the door, on the sides, and even over the top. In verse 23, God declares that he would pass over the door, cross over the threshold, into the house as a welcome guest, in covenant with the elder of the house, and thus all the residents, and would therefore not allow the destroyer to come in. This is God's house where he is worshipped. This is an obvious golden door. These people are mine, my people. Evil, stay out. 
Trumbull writes in page 203 and 206, quote, how the significance of the Hebrew Passover rite stands out in the light of this primitive custom. It is not that this rite had its origin in the days of the Hebrew Exodus from Egypt, but that Jehovah then and there emphasized the meaning and sacredness of a rite already familiar to Orientals. In dealing with his chosen people, God did not invent a new rite or ceremony at every stage of his progressive revelation to them, but he took a rite with which they were already familiar and gave to it a new and deeper significance in its new use and relations. In furtherance of this purpose, the Lord asked for the sacrifice of the threshold crossover by the Hebrews, quote, for the Lord will pass through the land to smite the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood upon the lintel and the two side posts of the Hebrew homes, the Lord will pass over, cross over or through the door, and will not allow the destroyer to come in to your houses to smite you. Obviously, the figure here is employed is of a sovereign accompanied by his executioner, a familiar figure in the ancient east, his bodyguard. And when he comes to a house marked by the tokens of a welcoming covenant, the sovereign will covenant enter into the house, cross over the threshold, enter the home as a guest or as a member of the family, but where no such preparation has been made for him, his executioner bodyguard will enter on his mission of judgment. Wow. In Joshua chapter 2, verse 1, the woman Rahab, who was the innkeeper, invited the two spies into her house, and the protection of the house was upon them. That's in Joshua chapter 2, verse 1 and following. Since this was such a strong and enduring symbol, it was alluded to in many ways such as Trumbull points out on page 210 and 11. He says, Later Jewish traditions and customs point to the meaning of the original Passover rite as a crossing over the threshold of the Hebrew homes by Jehovah and not of his passing by his people in order to their sparing, a custom by which a Hebrew slave became one of the family in the Hebrew household through having his ear bored with an awl at the doorpost of the house and thereby blood staining the doorway. It's connected with the Passover rite by the rabbis. God said the door and the side posts were my witnesses in Egypt in the hour when I passed over the lintel and the two side posts and I said that to me, the children of Israel shall be slaves and not slaves to slaves. I brought them out of bondage to freedom. And this man who goes and takes a Lord to himself shall be bored through before these witnesses, the doorway. But even a greater symbol is brought out in Jeremiah. And boy, when I saw this, it exploded Jeremiah 31, verse 31, Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which covenant they broke, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. What covenant was that? This one, the threshold covenant, but it was even greater, although I was a husband to them. It was a marriage covenant as well. In fact, all of the covenant symbols melt together. Jeremiah 31, 33. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel 
After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts, and I will write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. He will enter not into their houses, but into them. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Isn't that beautiful? This marriage covenant, sacrificing a lamb, prefigures the marriage to the lamb in the book of Revelation. So here we see the real essence of covenant theology. God made every covenant possible with Israel in an effort to assure them of his favor and his providence and his protection, knowing that by his choice of them as his people, they were also being marked out for disdain, aggression, and relentless persecution by the adversary who hated them with cruel hate. This also explains the exaggerated use of the symbols at the doorstep of Passover, not only blood upon the threshold as required, but all around the doorway, top and sides, to emphasize his complete entry into their entire lives as protector, benefactor, and lover. This was their golden door to freedom. For Israel to turn away from this remarkable divine overture would constitute the most perfidious betrayal. Is the same true of our nation today? Have we, founded by his favor, are we destined for the same fate? On those nights, we and Israel got our identity. They were God's people, my people, and that event sealed it. Here follows a fascinating exposition of the term, my people. Exodus 3, 7, and 10. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. In verse 10, Come now, therefore, I will send you, Moses, unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And then in Exodus 5, 1, 7, 16, 8, 1, 9, 1, 9, 13, and others, let my people go, that they may serve me. Exodus 7, 4. But Pharaoh will not hearken to you that I may lay my hand upon Egypt and bring forth mine armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. Exodus 8.23 I will put division between my people and thy people, Egypt. There's going to be a division, a dividing line, different treatments of things. The plague won't occur there. Leviticus 26.12 and I will walk among you, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people. Wow. Ruth made a right choice, and even because she even became one of the women in the Christ line. Look at Ruth 116. Ruth 116. Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, nor to return from following after thee, for withers thou goest, I will go, and where you lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. And then God sent the best to lead his people. But that was a heavy weight as well as a privilege, for then the adversary's attack was focused on the leaders. First Samuel 9, 16 and 17. 1 Samuel 9, 16 and 17. Tomorrow about this time, God told Samuel, I will send you a man out of the land of Benjamin, and thou shalt anoint him to be captain over my people, 
Israel, that he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people, because their cry is come unto me. And when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said to him, Behold, the man whom I spoke to thee of, the same shall reign over my people. Wow. Saul was good for a while, but then he stumbled under the pressure. Second Samuel 3.18 Now then do it, for the Lord has spoken of David, saying, By the hand of my servant David will I save my people Israel out of the hand of the Philistines and out of the hand of all their enemies. So God chose Israel as his people. So it occurs over and over and over throughout the Bible. But also there was a road down because once they were designated as God's people, then the adversaries that relentless attacks was focused upon them and upon their leaders. In 1 Kings 14.7, Jeroboam was the king of the northern ten tribes, and when he was inaugurated, he sent a prophet. 1 Kings 14.7, Go tell Jeroboam, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, for as much as I exalted thee from among the people and made thee prince over my people Israel. In 1 Kings 16, 2, For as much as I exalted thee out of the dust and made thee prince over my people Israel, and thou hast walked in the way of Jeroboam and hast made my people Israel to sin, to provoke me to anger with their sins. Look at Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles 7, 13. If I shut up heaven, that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Well, I ask with tears, is the same true for our nation today? Are we failing? Are we on the brink of doom? Do we need a new birth of freedom too? Look at Psalm 81. Psalm 81 repeats my people. It is the my people psalm. Psalm 81, verse 1. Sing aloud unto God our strength. Make a joyful noise unto the God of Jacob. Take a psalm and bring hither the timbrel, the pleasant harp with the psaltery. Blow up the trumpet in the new moon, in the time appointed, on our solemn feast day. For this was a statute for Israel and a law of the God of Jacob. This he ordained in Joseph for a testimony when he went out through the land of Egypt, where I heard a language that I understood not. I removed his shoulder from the burden. His hands were delivered from the pots. Thou callest in trouble, and I delivered thee. I answered thee in the secret place of thunder. I proved thee at the waters of Mariba, Selah. Hear, O my people, and I will testify unto thee, O Israel, if thou wilt hearken unto me, there shall no strange God be in thee, neither shalt thou worship any strange God. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide, and I will fill it. But my people would not hearken to my voice, and Israel would none of me. So I gave them up under their own hearts lust, and they walked in their own counsels. Oh, that my people had hearkened unto me, and Israel had walked in my ways. I should soon have subdued their enemies, and turned my hand against their adversaries. The haters of the Lord should have submitted themselves unto him. 
but their time should have endured forever. He should have fed them also with the finest of the wheat, and with the honey out of the rock should I have satisfied thee. Wow. But Israel ultimately bowed under the pressure and temptation and attacks. Isaiah spoke of this a lot. Isaiah 1, 3, the ox knows his owner, and the ass his master's crib, but Israel doth not know. My people doth not consider. They were dumber than donkeys. Their common sense was missing. Does that sound familiar? Isaiah 3, 12 and 15, for my people... Children are their oppressors. Women rule over them. O oh, my people, they which lead thee, cause thee to err, and destroy the way of thy paths. What mean ye that you beat my people to pieces and grind the faces of the poor, saith the Lord God of hosts? Isaiah 5.13 Therefore my people are gone into captivity, because they have no knowledge and their honorable men are famished, and their multitude dried up with thirst. Wow! Isaiah 22, 4. Therefore said I, look away from me, and I will weep bitterly. Labor not to comfort me, because of the spoiling of the daughter of my people. Isaiah 51, 4. Hearken unto me, my people, and give ear unto me, O my nation. For a law shall proceed from me, and I will make my judgments to rest for a light of the people. And I put my words in thy mouth, and have covered thee in the shadow of mine hand, that I may plant the heavens, and lay the foundations of the earth, and say unto Zion, Thou art my people. Wow. And then the greatest one, Isaiah 53, 8 about the Messiah. And he was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off of the land of the living for the transgression of my people. Was he stricken? He took our sins upon himself. Jeremiah also talks about my people. Jeremiah 2.11 Hath a nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid, and be very desolate, saith the Lord. Because you know what? Of all the nations of the ancient time, no other nation changed their gods except Israel and changed it from the true God to Baal and Ashtoreth. Wow. Jeremiah 2.13 For my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Jeremiah 4.22 For my people is foolish they have not known me. They're foolish children, and they have no understanding. They are wise to do evil, but to do good, they have no clue. Ha! Huh. Wow. Jeremiah 6. The whole chapter is, is just, just really something to read. You read that in your review. Jeremiah 9. Again, it's just heart-wrenching to read. Oh, that my head were waters, and mine eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain daughter of my people. Oh, that I had in the wilderness a lodging place of wayfaring men, that I might leave my people and go from them. For they be all adulterers, an assembly of treacherous men, and they bend their tongues like the bow for lies, and they are not valiant for the truth upon the earth. 
for they proceed from evil to evil, and they know not me, saith the Lord. Oh my God. That's what happened to my people in the Old Testament when they left him. Shall that happen to us? Jeremiah 11, 4, which I commanded your fathers in the day I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt, the very day we're talking about, from the iron furnace saying, obey my voice and do them according to all which I command you. So shall ye be my people, and I will be your God. Jeremiah fourteen seventeen. Therefore thou shalt say this word unto them, Let mine eyes run down with tears night and day, and let them not cease. For the virgin daughter of my people is broken with a great breach and with a very grievous blow. Wow. Just one punch after another punch after another punch in the gut. But God held out. He held out in his mercy. Jeremiah 24, 7. And I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. Ezekiel 13.9 And mine hand shall be upon the prophets that see vanity and divine lies. They shall not be in the assembly of my people, neither shall they be written in the writing of the house of Israel. Neither shall they enter into the land of Israel, and ye shall know that I am the Lord thy God. Because even because they have seduced my people, saying, Peace, when there was no peace. And one built up a wall low, others daubed it with untempered mortar, <laughs> just mud. Well, what do you think is going to happen to that wall? You know, prophets are supposed to build walls to protect, to divide, to mark what's good behavior and not. Ezekiel 33, 31. And they come unto me as a people comes, and they sit before me as my people, and they hear my words, but they don't do them, for with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goes after their covetousness. Ooh. Man, in this light, I think we now see in shocking clarity the pertinence of the term describing the opposite of my people that's pointed out by E.W. Bullinger. Lo ami, which means not my people. Look at Hosea. Hosea chapter 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, the son of Beeri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. The beginning of the word of the Lord to, by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, Go, go, Take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms, for the land hath committed great whoredom, departing from the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblam, which conceived and bare him a son. And the Lord said unto him, Call his name Jezreel, for yet a little while, and I will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu, and I will cause to cease the kingdom out of the house of Israel. And it shall come to pass at that day, and I'll break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. And she conceived again and bare a daughter. And God said to him, Call her name Lorumhama, for I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. 
But I will have mercy upon the house of Judah, and will save them by the Lord their God, and will not save them by bow, nor by sword, nor by battle, by horses, nor by horsemen. And when she had weaned Lor Huhama, she conceived and bare a son. And then said God, Call his name Lo Ami, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. Woo! This is Lo Ami, not my people. And it is a cogent concept, which even has chronological and genealogical sequence. Ren's going to point that out in a future session because certain individuals will be excised from the official genealogies and certain times will be left out of the numbering of years because of their wickedness. Wow. Rotherham translated the last half of verse 9 where it says, I will not be your God. Rotherham says, I will not be yours. In the Hebrew, it uses the same word as in Exodus 3.14. Translated, I am that I am. Hayah. I will become what I will become is what it should be in Exodus 3.14. And here in Hosea 1.9, it's literally, and I, not, I will become to you. So God refused to be that covenant God who would become whatever my people need me to become. They had sunk down so far by then. Yet, far in the future, things would turn around because the next verse in Hosea chapter 1, verse 10, yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, You are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, You are the sons of the living God. Wow! This was anticipated, of course, for the millennial kingdom. That not my people was the opposite of the marriage. It was divorce. That which comes by the idiom of permission for their evil tied God's hands and he all can all but allow the adversary to free reign because there's no longer any defense possible. But God had a plan. Hosea 3.23 He said, I will sow her unto me in the earth and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. And I will say to them who are not my people, Thou art my people. And they shall say, Thou art my God. Well, who are those people? Look at Romans. Romans chapter 10. Verse 18, But I say, have they not heard? Yea, verily their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the earth. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation will I anger you. But Isaiah was very bold, and said, I was found of them that sought me not, and I was made manifest unto them that asked not for me. But to Israel, he saith, all day long, I've stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite, the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin, Paul says. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Know ye not what the scripture says? of Elijah, how he made intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they've killed thy prophets and dug down your altars, and I'm left alone, and they seek my life. 
But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed a knee to the image of Baal. Even so, then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. And David said, Let their table be made a snare and a trap, and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see, and bow down their back all way. I say, then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. <laughs> so we got to be my people. Zechariah 2.11 Zechariah 2.11 And many nations shall be joined unto the Lord in that day and shall be my people. And I will dwell in the midst of thee, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto thee. Well, no, they thought this would occur at the millennial kingdom. Zechariah 8, 7, and 8. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country, and I will bring them, and they shall dwell in the midst of of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. They thought it was going to be at the millennial kingdom, but God had a secret plan that it would come to pass before them for us Gentiles, because it was part of the great mystery. God was thinking of us. Romans 9, 25 and 26 as he said also in Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not my beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, you are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. At 10 p.m. on April 18th, 1775, Dr. Joseph Warren summoned Paul Revere and gave him the task of writing to Lexington, Massachusetts with the news that the British soldiers stationed in Boston were about to march into the countryside northwest of the town. The following is from History.com. When his associates learned the British were moving troops out of Boston and planned to arrest revolutionary leaders Samuel Adams and John Hancock in Lexington, Revere was tasked with tipping them off to help them avoid arrest. He first used his signal system and had two lanterns placed in the Old North Church steeple in Boston to alert those in the harbor that the troops had left Boston and were crossing the Charles River. Then, at about 10 p.m. on April 18, 1775, Revere set out in the dark from his North Boston home by horse with William Dawes to reach Adams and Hancock. The two riders met Adams and Hancock in Lexington and enabled the revolutionaries to avoid arrest. Revere's next stop that late night was Concord, Massachusetts, a hotbed of resistance and the suspected location of the British troops' second attack. But Revere, Dawes, and a third rider named Samuel Prescott were captured by the British en route, and only Prescott reached Concord. Revere was soon released, but he had already helped give the colonial militia a key advantage by alerting them to the impending attack by the British. The battles of Lexington and Concord would spark the Revolutionary War. 
He became an American folk hero about 100 years later because of Henry Wadsworth's Longfellow's stirring retelling of his act of patriotism in Paul Revere's Ride. It begins with the now famous lines, Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere, and depicts a dangerous midnight ride as Revere warns the colonists about the British attack. That night, in a way, our nation was being born. Families also had to make a choice between bondage and freedom, and by God's grace and favor, our nation still persists today. How close is the parallel with Israel long ago? My friends, April 18th, 1775 was during Passover week 1775. Passover week for the Hebrew year, that year 5535 in the Hebrew calendar, began in the Diaspora on Friday, April 14th, 1775, and ended on Saturday, April 22nd. It happened during Passover. Was that a portend? for our future? Was our nation also marked out and blessed as a haven for his people to freely worship him according to the dictates of their hearts? Do we have the same holy charge to quit ourselves like his people? If so, my forefathers' patriot blood within me shouts, we as a nation are losing our way just like they lost theirs. Let us call our people back to the word, like the prophets of old called theirs, and let us, as this nation, under God, have a new birth of freedom, and that this government of the people, by the people, and for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Give us your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. We lift our lamp of God's word beside the golden door. Bless you.